Hello friends, my name is Dr. Vikram Barua Kaushik. I'm a senior consultant in urology and kidney transplant surgery at Artemis Hospitals, Gurgaon. Uh, today I shall be speaking about kidney stones. Stones in the urinary tract are a very common uh, occurrence to, in today's day and age. And uh, the stones may be located in the, primarily they are formed in the kidney. They may get stuck up in the ureter and there may be stones in the urinary bladder also. The most common symptom is a severe excruciating pain on the side in which the stone is stuck. And it most commonly happens when there is a stone in the ureter. And it is very unlikely that a small non-obstructing stone located in one corner of the kidney would be causing symptoms such as pain. But it is only when these stones pass down into the ureter and they cause an obstruction that the pain really happens. The other symptoms which a patient may have, they may be blood in the urine, they may be high grade fever or in some patients in which the kidney function starts getting affected, the patients may have nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, a feeling of being unwell, etc. So when a particular patient comes to us with a suspicion of a stone in the urinary tract, we run a certain tests which start with a basic urine routine, urine test, some blood test to see the kidney function. Then we would initially have an ultrasound to see if there is any swelling in the kidney. Ultrasound at times may not pick up a small stone located in the ureter, in which case we would like to have a non-contrast CT. Now a non-contrast CT is believed to be the gold standard in identifying and characterizing a stone in the urinary tract. It has a sensitivity of more than 99%. So if there is a stone, it will definitely be picked up on a CT scan, on a plain CT scan. And uh, now depending on the size of the stone and the location of the stone and the symptoms and the kidney function, the further treatment of the stone is discussed with the patient in detail. All options are given and then uh, finally a plan is made to deal with the patient. There are certain subset of patients in whom a detailed metabolic evaluation is needed to be undertaken to try and identify if there are any risk factors which makes the patient more prone for recurrent stone formation. Among these are patients who present with stones in both the kidneys or patients who are in the pediatric age group and have formed stones or patients with some anatomical abnormality also may be required to be evaluated in further detail. Like if there is an obstruction at the PUJ level, that is the pelvic junction, then stones may form in the kidney secondary to that obstruction, in which case just taking out the stone would not suffice and there would need to be a definitive treatment to take care of the obstruction at the level of the pelvic junction, which is known as a pyeloplasty. Stones in the bladder may be of two sources. They may be stones which have passed down from the kidney through the ureter and then stuck up in the bladder. Or sometimes stones form in the bladder secondary to an obstruction in the lower urinary tract. In, in gentlemen, the most common cause being an enlarged prostate. And when there is an enlarged prostate and there is a retention of urine, large volume of retention of urine, then secondary stones may form in the urinary bladder also in which case the patient would need treatment for both the uh, stone in the urinary bladder as well as the enlarged prostate. Now in today's day and age, urological management of urinary stones has, has become very uh, non-invasive and or minimally invasive at the most. We have in our armamentarium a wide variety of telescopes and endoscopes and lasers through which we can very effectively and efficiently treat the patient with these urinary stones so that the loss of work to the particular patient is minimum and they can go back home at the earliest and join back their normal activity. Let us divide the treatment depending on the location of the stones. Now for a stone in the kidney, the various options that are available at our uh, disposal are first the most non-invasive treatment would be to go for ESWL or extracorporeal shortwave lithotripsy wherein sound waves are generated from an external generator and the beams are focused onto the stone. 
and blasted so that the stone breaks into very small particles and finally pass out with the urine. This is suitable for stones which are up to about a centimeter in size and also depends on the location of the stone. A stone located in the upper part or the middle part of the kidney are more feasible for such form of treatment. Whereas a stone which is located in the deep lower calyx of the kidney may not be a suitable candidate for such a non-invasive treatment. Then comes the technique called retrograde intrarenal surgery wherein a flexible ureteroscope is introduced through the urinary passage, is taken all the way up to the kidney through the ureter and the stone is visualized endoscopically and then using holmium laser or other laser systems, we can powder the stone into very fine dust and then the fragments pass out through the urinary passage. The third procedure is known as percutaneous nephrolithotomy or PCNL, which is used for slightly larger stones, maybe about 1.5 to 2 centimeters or even larger, and uh, wherein a small puncture is made in the back of the patient. A telescope is introduced directly into the kidney through a sheath and the stone is visualized on the monitor, broken if required, or can be taken out as a single piece if the tract is large enough. Now, all these modalities are available with us, and depending on the characteristics of the stone and the patient, after a proper discussion, we can plan for the final management of the stones. Now, for a stone which is stuck up in the ureter, the procedure of choice would be there are again two options. If it is in the upper part of the ureter, we have the option of just blasting the stone with ESWL or shockwave lithotripsy as in the kidney. But generally, this form of treatment may not be very suitable if it is a very tightly impacted stone or if it is a stone larger than one centimeter in size in the upper ureter, wherein the results are slightly inferior. In such cases or in stones located in the lower or middle part of the ureter, we do a procedure known as ureterorhinoscopy wherein a fine telescope is introduced through the urinary passage, we reach up to the stone and then blast it with laser or other uh, stone breaking equipment such as a pneumatic lithoclast or a holmium laser. Finally, we come to stones which are in the urinary bladder. Like I had said pre previously, they can be of two types. Firstly, the ones which were formed in the kidney the past the ureter and then finally got stuck up in the urinary bladder. Now these sort of stones are invariably not very large and they can be effectively managed by a daycare procedure known as systolithotrity wherein we go in with a telescope through the urinary passage, go into the bladder, break the stone and just remove it. Secondary stones in the urinary bladder are also known. They happen in patients who have some obstruction in the urinary outlet or which is known as bladder outlet obstruction, which most commonly is because of an enlarged prostate in a, in a male patient or can be also there in patients who have a neurogenic bladder whose bladder function is uh, suboptimal because of some neurological deficit. They retain a lot of urine and then form stones. These stones have the characteristic of be being very smooth and uh, uh, large in size and invariably they require treatment, simultaneous treatment of the bladder outlet obstruction, especially in patients with a prostatic enlargement. So in a patient with a prostatic enlargement with a secondary stones in the bladder, the ideal treatment would be to take out the stones endoscopically either through the periurethral passage or we can also take it out from the suprapubic area that is in the lower abdomen. We make a tract, pass in a telescope directly into the bladder, break the stone if they are very large and then take out the stones from there through that tract. And then we deal with the prosthetic by doing a laser TURP using Holmium laser or a standard TURP using monopolar or bipolar technique. In patients with neurogenic bladder who form stones, patient would need removal of the bladder stones to prevent infection and also they may not be candidates for a surgery for the bladder outlet unless of course there is a definite proof of bladder outlet obstruction on a urodynamic study which would be done after the stones are removed. So all in all, I would like to summarize by saying that stones in the urinary tract are a fairly common occurrence. We see patients every day with them and uh, the treatments are in today with modern urological techniques and equipment we can very effectively and safely treat these patients with various non-invasive and minimally invasive techniques.
Now, for patients who've undergone a stone surgery, it is very important that in the future, they always stay on the lookout to see for recurrence. Ideally, a patient should have at least an ultrasound once every six months. Their fluid intake should be adequate, at least two to three liters of fluid so that they make about one and a half to two liters of urine in 24 hours. And they should have a well-balanced high fiber diet.